This is Wednesday's Women, hosted by Caitlin and Taylor. We invite you to join us in a candid conversation about the roles of women in political organizing and beyond as we celebrate the centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment. We hope that you find this ed episode educational, entertaining, and the women we discuss inspiring. If you like what you hear, subscribe and share. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another wonderful episode of Wednesday's Women, Episode 2, Season 2. So for today's episode, we have a very special guest, Dr. Dale Elizabeth Pearson, who is the president of Clarion University. Um, the reason why we chose to have her on was for a few reasons. One, uh, tomorrow, this episode is airing on September 9th. So tomorrow for you guys, September 10th, is Founders Day for Clarion University. So today we're going to talk about Clarion's timeline, 150 years, crazy. So we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about women in higher education, since Dr. Dale is a woman in higher education, and we are women that are going through our higher education. Yep. So Dr. Dale, would you mind giving us a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Oh, sure. Hi, I'm uh, Dale Elizabeth Pearson. I've been at Clarion University for two years. I've been in higher education. Oof. Um, I started as a faculty member in 1998 as a full-time faculty member, but prior to that, I worked uh, adjunct or part-time instructor uh, in the, through the 90s. Uh, and then I had a career in, in healthcare. Prior to going into the academy, my uh, background was uh, I was a licensed practical nurse and then I became a registered nurse, went to college, got my different graduate degrees. And when I went on for my uh, post baccalaureate degree, uh, I did it in mental health, which and so my doctorate's in counseling. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about that is people say, well, you know, why did you switch fields? And I really didn't. I think healthcare and nursing is, is wellness and focused on um, a good, healthy life. Mental health, same principles, still has diagnosis, still has treatments and so forth. And then <laughs> what does that say about leadership in higher ed? Well, it's wellness. It's uh, taking action, taking good communication, all of those things that we do in healthcare and in mental health. So I think that for me, I had a long career of helping people find their best potential. So uh, that's kind of a little bit about me. All right. So we do have a couple interview questions for you. Um, what drew you to Clarion specifically? Well, I, I, I'm a state, uh, state university graduate uh, at the undergraduate and the graduate level. And I've always worked at state universities. So the mission of educating for the public good is uh, something that I personally benefited from. And so a state school was a very important place for me to go. I knew that that was really where I was going to be called to. That was the work that I needed to do. PASHI is a system. So I knew being part of a system, I would have a statewide support of a chancellor and other presidents. So I, that was also important to me. Uh, Clarion itself, uh, there are three things about Clarion that I love. Uh, one, that it had a huge online portfolio so that we are educating not just traditional on the ground students, but also uh, adult degree completers, people who want to go back and find their dreams, uh, who can't particularly travel to a campus, and who don't really want to have the college transformational experience of 18 to 24 year olds. They really want to ramp up their credentials and have a better life in terms of education. So that I liked. Um, I, and in a rural part of the world, that's very important very often to individuals, especially with bad weather and so forth, driving on the roads. Then the other thing is that it's a legacy school with uh, education. So even though it started out as a seminary, it did become a normal school and then became teacher prep, which uh, is part of uh, the mission of many of the universities I've worked at. And at the, at the core, I am an educator, I'm a teacher. So I, I like being around people who are really focused on good practice in the classroom so that students really learn and have a meaningful experience. Then I also like the fact that our students come from the rural areas. Many of them are first generation college students, much like myself. I was the first one in my, my family to go to college. And um, so that's something. And the students come from pretty humble beginnings. Uh, most of them, their means are some are in poverty, some are in very low socioeconomic means. And this is a chance really to help people lift themselves into the middle class 
and to have a profession and an education and really transform themselves, their families, their lives, and very often their communities. So for all those reasons, uh, Pennsylvania really appealed to me. And I am from the East Coast. I have relatives in Pennsylvania, born in New York. And so this part of the world, uh, rural America, even though I'm, you know, I, I lived in, on Long Island, um, I spent a good part of my adult life working and living in rural America, and I love it. So. so our final discussion question, in three words, how would you describe your experience as president at Clarion thus far? Um, compelling, terrifying, and rewarding. That's great. So now that we know a little bit more about our guest, we're going to jump into the timeline of our wonderful Clarion University. So I'm going to start from our beginnings. So unlike a lot of other schools in our state system here in Pennsylvania, Clarion did not start out, start out as a normal school from the Normal <laughs> School Act that occurred in 1857. So Clarion actually started out as a seminary school. So in 1859, some local citizens generated a proposal for the creation of a seminary school here in Clarion. So this institution began operating September 1867, and it was called the Carrier Seminary of Western Pennsylvania. And the reason why it was called that was because a carrier family was their name, and their contributions of $6,000, 1867 money, which would be $105,000 today money, um, they put forth for lumber to make the school and to build buildings to be on the campus. Lacking any facilities of their own, classes were hold, held in the old um, academy building. And so the seminary was a co-educational institution held by the Reverend James G. Townsend as principal and Miss A.E. Reinhardt as preceptus. Um, so Carrier's calendar was called for three 13-week to it terms with tuition as follows. So common English branches were $6 for the term, which would be $105 today. Higher English branches were $7, which would be $122 today, and languages, which was $8, $140 today, which I just found to be very interesting since so many of us focus on the price tag of what education is like today. Um, and one quote that I found about Carrier at the time was, Carrier was described as the only normal college for the perfection of teachers under the supervision of the ME Church, which I found to be very interesting. So due to some financial constraints, Clarion State Normal School, the successor came about as the successor to Carrier Seminary, and they opened their doors in April of 1887. So the Commonwealth's purchase of Clarion was official in December of 1915, with the state assuming full control the following year. So the state paid $20,000 to satisfy stockholders and another $49,000 to satisfy debts that the university had had at the time. So the first faculty of Clarion actually only had 11 members and the first graduating class had 10 men and two women, which showed you how small this location started and to what we've become today. And another thing that I found to be very interesting at the time to continue chronologically is there was a student cadet corps that was formed in 1891 during the Spanish American war and Davis, who at the time was president was a major and they had a number of his cadets that were through the university and they served with the national guard from April 19 or excuse me, 1898 to January, 1899. So we also have um, students here at the university that are with the military and serving while they get their education. So that just goes to show that we've had a long list and long lineage of working with our governments um, and with our militaries. So the US entered World War I in April, 1917, and that affected not just Clarion University, but all higher education. Um, it brought a sharp decline in enrollment as the number of students fell from 287 um, and Stevens Hall was actually closed during this time for cost-saving measures. Stevens Hall is still used today here at our campus. Um, once the war was over, enrollment reached 913 students for the 1924 to 1925 school year. So that just goes to show how drastic the decline was to how much people were ready to get back into academics following the war. Right. So once... Dr. Clyde T. Green became principal of the school. 
Um, administration seemed to pull the university out of its enrollment slump by raising teacher standards, increasing student activities, and making physical improvements to the campus. Such improvements included a new athletic field, the tennis courts, um, the remodeled library, and new heating plant and renovations to existing buildings. Something that we are always doing is, um, even today, constantly making renovations to our campus and improving the building. So just nice to see that you know, it's been a long process that we can continue to work on even today. Um, Clarion became a college level institution in 1920. So centennial 1920, today is, this year is 2020. So it's also around the time that women got the right to vote. So this was the state of PA's first community college, which was really interesting. Um, a student now needed 15 units of high school work to be considered for admission to the campus. And after 1924, intelligence tests were used as criteria for admission, very similar to lead to how we use the SAT scores and GPAs today. Um, the old normal school was composed of students who were preparing for entrance to College of Liberal Arts um, and technical schools and professional schools, a business school um, or the teaching profession. So Clarion was no longer a preparatory school, but rather a technical school of junior college rank. So Clarion became a college on May 28, 1929 under Dr. G.L. Reimer um, as president. And they renamed the university Clarion State Teachers College. Um, May 1929, the nation was in the midst of an unparalleled economic boom. So in the span of five short months, um, something really drastic happened, which was the Great Depression. Um, and otherwise known as Black Thursday, total panic seized the stock market. And by October, the bottom had dropped out. So that had a huge impact on all higher education, but specifically Clarion in this state, because it affected not only our money, but also enrollment. So before the Great Depression, Clarion received a yearly allocation of about 181,000 from the state. But after the Depression, we see received about 67,000. So that's a 63% cut. So you can only imagine with the lack of um, attendance by students with also that economic situation. Clarion was in a really um, harsh time. However, the university would weather this storm but not without making some significant changes. So some of the changes included, some of the changes included uh, charging tuition for the first time since 1901 and lowering admission standards to attract more students to the campus. Then Dr. Paul Gladstone Chandler, the son of a Methodist preacher arrived in Clarion as the nation was emerging from the doldrums of the depression and he led Clarion towards great heights during his 23 years as president. So we start to see that even back then we go through these periods of waxing and waning good prosperity into uh, financial and otherwise harsh times. But we always seem to come out of it better and stronger. Starting um, in the 1930s, the Clarion University did start to see an uptick in um, their funds, in the amount of detriments they saw. But one thing that did happen before 1930 that I specifically asked Caitlin not to talk about was, um, I wouldn't really call it a revolt, but in 19... Right, I remember that. This is always my favorite story of Clarion University, and I wore my tour guide polo today for the visual and audio. You to find audio. That? What? How long did that take you to find that? Took me 20 minutes. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for the auditory and visual history of Clarion University, um, this was my favorite story to tell when I would give students tours of Clarion University. If you've ever looked at Founders Hall, there are bricks on the front that are different colored, and it's not just decorative. So they used to have busts of the 13 Clarion founders, and that's why it's called Founders Hall. In 1903, students learned of a scandal where university administration embezzled money from the construction of Hart Chapel, um, which was built right next to Founders Hall. In, to show their dis disgust with this scandal, students climbed up to the busts on Founders Hall and doused them in red paint. 
At the time, it was common to make these busts out of sandstone, which is a very porous material, and so the paint soaked into these statues and they couldn't get it out. So they eventually had to go up and chisel them off. Um, and it was really one of the first big times that the students sort of revolted to anything that the university had done, though at the time it wasn't a university. Um, it's always been one of my favorite stories to tell just because it is a fun little fact of history. And as a political science and economics major, I spend so much of my time in Founders oh, Hall. <laughs> um, so that is something not fun, but something interesting that happened in the early 1900s. Um, while Clarion was on the uptick, after that, there were crises that kept intruding on the good times during the 1930s through the 1950s. Um, it was a time of a lot of soul searching, organization, reorganization, um, and operations on the various educational programs. These efforts did result in the primary achievement of academic responsibility for respectability, not responsibility, of the Chandler administration. So in 1948, Clarion was accredited by the Middle States Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools, who we still receive accreditation from today. That's right. That's right. The accreditation was vital because it implied that Clarion's course offerings were now of collegiate quality in name as well in fact. So we weren't just calling ourselves a college, we were offering you college level education. Um, so then Dr. James Gemmel takes over in 1960 as president um, and he claimed to know what it would take to, Clary, to make Clarion State College successful. He said the basic ingredients of a good college are namely able students, sufficient money, and sense of purpose, plus able administration and teachers. Um, personally, I believe Clarion has that today, and Dr. Gemmel made sure that Clarion had that during his tenure. When he arrived, there were about 1,100 students and 10 buildings, and the sole educational function of the institution had been teacher preparation. That's right. When he left in 1976, the student body had expanded to about 5,000 students, with 25 buildings either completed, under construction, or on the drawing boards. Um, and Clarion's mission had expanded into that of a multi-purpose institution. So the buildings included in the expansion of the university were Carrier, Chandler Dining, Becker, Given Hall, Ralston, Nair, Campbell, Wilkinson, Carlson, the Pierce Science Center, the Tippin Gymnasium, and Marwick Boyd Auditorium. Several of these are still on campus today. Tippin just received a renovation that wrapped up this year, um, right before students went home. In fact, <laughs> um, some of these buildings are no longer here. So the dining hall is gone. Um, Nair and Wilkinson have been replaced by the suites on Main. Um, so the face of the university is constantly shifting, but there are principles that still remain at the heart through all of these changes. So much of the change that resulted from Dr. Gemmel's presidency came from two major decisions. The first decision was that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania chose to convert its single purpose teacher colleges into multi-purpose state colleges. And so they just recognized that there was more use than just educating people to be teachers. Right. So you would attend college for more than just an education degree. The second decision was that the trustees hired Gemmel as president and he knew what it would take to get Clarion to be a respectable institution and really raise it in the eyes of the Pennsylvania Commonwealth. Because of this growth, major adjustments were required on campus and in the local community. Expansion of the institution required the acquisition of a significant amount of private property in the Clarion borough. Um, so colleges do have the legal right to um, take in land for public use. It's under eminent domain. Eminent domain. <laughs> um, not always popular with people to be told we're going to take your house and put a dormitory on it. Um, but it is within the legal right of public colleges and universities. Um, but many local citizens did question the disruption to their lives. And you do lose your tax base when you take private yes. land and make it public. That's right. So there were, um, there was a little bit of conflict with that. 
1967, the university and the town were at odds over the university's expansion and the town's subsequent real estate losses, as well as the tax rolls. Um, to sort of appease these issues, local government entities helped the expansion. And so the university brought local boroughs in to help discuss what the best expansion way would be. So Clarion Borough Council tied the school's expansion into its federally funded urban renewal plan. And the Clarion County commissioners partnered with the school in an urban renewal plan. So that way it was still giving back to the community um, in more ways than just bringing in students. They were seeing um, these urban renewal plans come to fruition. So throughout this time, the growing student population was still politically and socially active as well as receiving their education. So students were involved in protests against on-campus activities of military recruiters as well as American involvement in the Vietnam conflict. Um, this was fairly common for the time on college campuses, and there were actually a couple of Supreme Court cases really questioning the legality of someone coming on and recruiting people into the military, and could you deny them? So you can't deny a military recruiter, but sometimes students who disagree with the conflict or just the idea of conflict that they're recruiting you to will protest. Um, so it's not uncommon to see these, and it is kind of impressive to see students organizing themselves so young. So around the end of Gemmell's administration, students group, student groups of all kinds were forming. The number of campus organizations has not waned since then. Student life has roughly 150 plus campus organizations, yeah. which students can get involved in. And these range across all kinds of fields, including academic, athletic, Greek, political, multicultural service, um, and a variety of special interest groups. Caitlin and I are involved in several groups on campus. And this time was really known as the golden era for Clarion University, for their student groups, for their athletics, for their academics. Um, and it really led to Clarion winning awards and accreditations across the board. So this is when the first female athletics teams were introduced. So they started as an intramural team in the late 1960s and by three years later, they had become an official recognized team at Clarion University. Um, so through all these booms and all these great acclamations and accreditations, um, Commonwealth funding was never a certainty, and sometimes it was called into question, were these plans they were putting in place going to be sustainable if we weren't going to have a certain source of income? Um, so budget appropriations did not always keep up with growing enrollment. Tuition and fees started to increase regularly, and by the mid-70s, retrenchment and layoffs became part of the campus vocabulary. During the early 70s, Gemmell was frequently the financial spokesman in Harrisburg for the state colleges as a whole. Um, and this would include explaining decisions being made on individual college campuses, as well as just asking, we need money. We can't keep these universities afloat with zero funding. Um, Clarion University sought their own solution and founded the Clarion State College Foundation on December 8, 1969. The foundation was founded on the premise of providing people with an opportunity to donate to Clarion State College and ensure that their contribution would be used as intended rather than donating to the state system as a whole and seeing it divided amongst all the universities. Contributions still fund scholarship programs, um, selected capital projects, and other projects across the campus today. The foundation is still up and running and Caitlin and I have both received scholarships through them that we and many other students are immensely grateful for. Um, in 1969, unionization became part of the university culture with the Association of Pennsylvania State Colleges and University Faculty and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees becoming official representation for two groups of employees across the state system. Both those unions are still active today. Um, Clarion was the vanguard of state colleges and a survey reported in May 1975 that Gemmel had turned the tide in the community. According to the survey, 91% of the participants were proud that Clarion State College was in their community. And 
retrospectively, this was really only a short time after they were upset about the eminent domain claim. Yeah, yeah. So the following year, Gemmel announced his intentions to leave Clarion. Um, he did move on to become the associate director of the Academic Collective Bargaining Service, a Washington, D.C.-based consulting service. In recognition of his leadership service at Clarion, a student complex which houses student organizations, a food court, meeting rooms, mail rooms, and offices was named in his honor. So that is where our student office is housed. That is, office, that is also where the office I work at is housed. Um, kids are in there all day long. I love it's, my I would, say, like, <laughs> I would say Caitlin probably spent 23 hours a day in there last semester. <laughs> I did. I can, I tell you, like, uh, my favorite story, it was 5 a.m. And Matt Schaefer, who is Taylor and Mai's advisor for Student Senate, comes into the office and he's like, what are you doing here? It's 5 a.m. And I'm like, I have things to do. Why are you here? He's like, it's time to start to work. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's a great story. I what can hear you say that. <laughs> what Caitlin leaves out of that story is she didn't get there at 5 a.m. I know. I <laughs> Um, so when Gemmel retired in 1975, the university was on good terms with the community and maintained a steady student population. His, Gemmel's lengthy time at Clarion left an impression at the university and on its students. The next president was Thomas A. Bond, and he was named president June 3, 1980. He assumed responsibility after the university was under interim leadership for several years. Um, a year before Dr. Bond's arrival, Ernie moved, Ernie moved to campus, though not the Ernie we know and love today. If you've ever seen the Ernie mascot from the 1980s, he's very um, chicken-like. He looks a lot more intimidating now. Like, he looks like an eagle. Yeah. Back then, he did have a glow-up. He yeah. was the original glow-up. Mm -hmm. Highlights of the Bond administration include a change to university status, a substantial increase in enrollment, a significant number of retirements and replacements, the advancement in the realm of academic standards, and an introduction of campaigns to raise capital funds. The Bond years were considerable growth and change, both in the number and constitution of faculty and students. According to Vamiri's history, enrollment rose to six. 6,600 students during the 80s. Venango campus set an enrollment record in fall 1985 with 235 full-time and 377 part-time students. During this time, 80 faculty members and 95 staffers retired, opening the door to hire more people with terminal degrees, more females, and more minorities. The student body had also become more diverse. A notable change during Bond's presidency was that the state colleges were separated from the Pennsylvania Department of Education in 1982 and became part of the state system of higher education. So by the Legislative Act 188 of 1982, all 14 state colleges were taken from the control of the Pennsylvania Department of Education and placed under the jurisdiction of the newly created Pennsylvania state system of higher education which we often refer to just as PASHI, um, mostly just because it's a word, a mouthful. Bond quipped that he was the last president of Clarion State College and the first president of the Clarion University of Pennsylvania. Um, so this happened in 82, and this was the year that my grandmother graduated from Clarion University. And when I toured, all of my stuff says Clarion University of Pennsylvania, and she said that she remembered when they changed the name their biggest complaint was that their acronym would say CUP, and so people would refer to them as copies, which I just always thought was funny because I've never heard it called CUP while I'm there. But I will say, I call it ALF, and people go, oh, you mean ALF? And I'm like, have you ever just, like, looked at the word? <laughs> like, clearly says ALF. That's a, really like, big, that's a really big fight amongst students, though, ALF versus ALF. That's a big thing. It really is. Um, but she, she remembers being very upset at the name change and like she was distraught that they were changing the name and it wasn't going to be Clarion State College and 
so it was like a big deal which is weird because I, I would think it was weird if it was anything but Clarion University of Pennsylvania. So in an interview to kick off 150th celebrations, Bond said his presidency was marked by the establishment of the Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree at Venango campus and starting the certification process for the then College of Business. I get to talk about Clarion more currently, and but it's kind of funny as I hear you, you both talking, um, how people are always wanting to keep things the way it is because, or the way they knew it as they were students. Uh, to this day, I still talk to our alumni and they often will say, I graduated when it was Clarion State College. When, and, or my grandmother graduated when it was teacher prep, you know, or whatever name it was at, at the time. And everyone kind of gets frozen in the way it was, and they like that the best. Whenever a building is knocked down, there's a grieving and mourning because, well, I, I used to go to Chandler Dining, and I used to go to, you know, this particular residence hall. I, they call it dorms, but now we call it res halls. But everyone likes it the way it was. And what I'm always impressed about in higher education is that universities are always morphing and changing. They're, they need to morph and change to the, the context and the times and the needs of the students of today. So your needs as current students are very different from the baby boomers of the 1980s when we, were, we had a very large student population and we were bulging at the seams. Um, now we have fewer students who are your particular traditional age students and, and we have non-traditional students who, who come back uh, to classes or they come to school online and they access their education that way. But Diane Reinhardt was the first uh, woman president, and we were gonna talk a little bit about women in higher ed. And she was president for about 13 years. She actually was the first president to live in Eagle House, which is the president's residence down the hill, and um, moved from Music Hall or Moore Hall, where she had the, the avocado green bathroom tile and mustard <laughs> tile and, and so forth from that particular time into this house, which was built in the tradition of the governor's house in Harrisburg, uh, designed by the same architect, decorated by the same uh, period time and the time of the federal period when, uh, th when the Commonwealth was pretty much established. The interesting thing about the federal period is that the art is very European American and really doesn't, inter it does not represent all of the student population we have today. So uh, I always think to myself, I, why did they put that wallpaper up? That doesn't look like our student body. Well, it was the federal period, you know, that time. So we try to balance in Eagle House, the decorations to blend with the then, the history, but be respectful of our current population of students. So she was, she was the first woman president for 13 years. She lived, I think, from what I hear, she was a single person and she had a dog named, anybody know the dog's name? Okay, I think it was Maggie. She, uh, so the dog is in the picture and it's in Reinhardt Village Community Center. There's a picture of Diane and the dog. And that was her companion and the person and the, the companion who helped her uh, probably talk about all her worries at night <laughs> with. So she moved to, to uh, down to the Eagle, Eagle House, uh, which is, which most people don't know this, but it was built by all men employees of the university. Their names, uh, they, they were in a plaque in the back room. We took the plaque and put it in the front. When you come in the entrance, we honor the people who built the house. There are only three of them left working on campus. Um, and, uh, but they built this house and it, it's an indication to me of how budgets have changed. This house was, it took about three or four years to build. And it was built in a time when Pennsylvania was still funding education. The quality and craftsman, craftsmanship of the, the work that went into this house is uh, bar none, the best I've ever seen. And I've lived in a lot of different homes. The, um, so that was about 1997, 98, the house was built when education was funded very highly by the state in Pennsylvania. You asked me a question before when I started in higher education, and it was 1998. And every year for the last 22 years, every state college I've worked in has had costs cut in funding. They could never build a house like this today. 
there wouldn't be any funds for that. And when you think about it, an enormous extravagance to think that they would put that much money into a house. But we opened the house up and we've had many different events at the house because it's the, state, it's the state's funding and it's the students' funding and therefore we try to open it pre-COVID. Now, who knows when we'll do that again, but maybe someday soon. Um, so Diane was here for 13 years. She had a long presidency. And when I became the president, I had people from town and alumni and also a faculty come up to me and they were just so pleased that they got another woman president which I, at first that kind of struck me, why, why is that so odd? But when you think about it, in the history of Clarion, the first woman didn't become a president until almost the turn of the century. So that's really pretty amazing when you think it, but that's pretty typical of the history of people in the United States with regard to higher ed and women in these positions. It's only in the last two to three years that we've moved from 20% to 25% to almost 30% now. And in the next two years, there'll be tons of hiring that will happen and lots of retiring. So women and, and uh, people of color, BIPOC people, individuals will have a chance to uh, move into those roles. And I'm very excited that that's, that's a movement that's happening. So after Diane's 13 year history, we had a president for about seven years and that was Joe Grunewald. Now Joe Grunewald took Gemmell's work and advanced it. He, he was very proud of the accreditation, very proud of the colleges, really wanted to invest in, um, we were very proud of the nursing and the, the different programs we had, but he felt that the science and math was really missing. And so the Science and Technology Center, which he did a lot of work to raise funds for, is named in his, in his name. And just as Diane, who was very interested in student life and advocating for students, Reinhardt Village is named for Diane. So uh, you, you get a building very often named for you for the work that you're known for in, in many cases. Not all buildings are named for presidents, but sometimes that's the way it works. So Joe really advanced what we call niche accreditations. So we have a, a very, um, it's a very prestigious accreditation in business. Uh, and it's very hard to get. We're one of very few PASHI schools that have it. And you know, nursing is, of course, accredited, speech language. And if you go down, we have many, many accreditations. Our, um, our secondary education, special education, elementary education, early childhood, all of those have the appropriate accreditations. But we also have specialty accreditations within education, like autism, dyslexia, different kinds of credentialing, and so forth. Faculty work very hard to get those, to keep those accreditations up. And I think what it shows and what Joe really was striving to show was that we are not only small and intimate and do good teaching, you know, we are a very small place, you know, we're not like a big Penn State or a big, you know, NYU, but we are just as good that we are, the quality of our programs meet the national and international standards. And I, I'm very grateful to Joe for that. Joe uh, was very locally invested. He's, he lives in Knox. And uh, he's been a very good mentor to me as I have moved through my first two years of the presidency. So that was really a lot of contributions that Joe made. He was also, he, was, uh, he sees himself as, a, as an entrepreneur, tried to do a lot of really good things for fundraising. And uh, we established the Barnes Center, which now has moved on to Butler Health, but at the time it was pretty cutting edge. And so we've just, you know, that was what Joe was known for. And after Joe, um, we had another female, another woman president, and that was Karen Whitney. Now, Karen Whitney was here for about seven years and then went on to be the interim chancellor for a year, and now she's interim chancellor in Springfield, Illinois. She, um, she, Karen's major contribution to the university, people will often say it's housing, but I always thank Karen for this. She understood that the student population was shifting and changing, and we really didn't have enough support for our student services. We didn't have enough mental health services, healthcare, wellness, recreation, all of the things that students who maybe aren't involved in athletics uh, need to be successful. Uh, and so she hired Dr. Susan Fenske, who's, who's nationally an amazing leader in higher education, especially around the area of student affairs. And so everyone I work with on my cabinet uh, Karen hired, so she knew how to hire people. And they're very good. We have very good president's cabinet. And so her biggest contributions was saying, was really setting 
academics is essential, but we have to have student services as well. And, you know, there's always this tug between the, the two divisions. And my sense is this is how we work together. It's all about making sure the students progress to graduation. So whatever we have to do. So, you know, everyone wants more in their area. Oh, we need more of this and more of that. But, but Karen's biggest contribution was really establishing standards for best practice for uh, student affairs. And she hired me. Uh, Karen was the interim chancellor. I, I proceeded, uh, we had an interim president here for one year, uh, Pete, Pete, uh, Peter uh, Fackler, and he was, um, he was great. Came in, did a lot of work. We had some financial concerns and he kind of stabilized things. Our financial concerns continue and we, we get very little funding from the state. It's really decreased. And, and the unfortunate thing over the last 20 years is the student debt has really uh, risen. So we're in the process at Clarion of, uh, we've moved the housing is now the responsibility of the state again. That's away from the foundation. They bought the property and now it, the, the debt is now held by uh, Pashi. So that's, that's good. And we're hoping that uh, over the next couple of years, we can decrease some of the housing costs because unfortunately, the cost of building that new housing is a burden we've, uh, we've, got, to, we've got to change. So that's uh, one thing that we're looking at doing in terms of, um, and also doing some renovation of some of our older housing and hoping to have like no frills, but, but make it uh, places where students will just want to come and have a sense of community and they don't need to have separate and uh, private suites. They can really have uh, more shared suites and more. So we're excited about, you know, moving in that direction. I came two years ago and I'm telling you, I, this is not the presidency I signed up for. Um, I thought I was going to come to a, a nice small town, quiet, help, help build a really good place, bring it back to where it needs to be. And, one thing after another, we've had Pashi redesign and the chancellor's pushing us all on that. We're combining services here and there to try to cut costs. We hired a new chancellor and that man is filled with energy ideas and he's a big student advocate, but he's requiring us all to think differently. And so I feel like I've got my day job here at Clarion and then I've got my job with the chancellor with Pashi for all the redesign, but it's good. And, and, and then COVID hit. So we were well on our way with sustainability planning. We're well on our way to the, with the housing and all these things and March hit. And, and then we spent all summer planning after we moved the students off, which was really hard on everybody. And really thought we were gonna be able to, with a lot of good measures, open up. And then the, the trend started to increase. And we looked at all the counties where all of the students come to and, and come from, and it just it was just increasing. So now um, we, we decided to open mostly remote with the exception of 10% of our classes and leave the choice to the students, which, you know, we got about 600 students living on campus, probably about a thousand in town. And uh, we've got about quite a few hundred, almost a thousand in Venango County who travel in and then also Jefferson. So, you know, they're not on campus, but they're on campus. And so we left it open for them because of the access. But this is not a time for the, the weary and the, and, and the fearful. This is a time to roll your sleeves up and really say, okay, higher ed is not exactly what we all think it was and is, but we have one thing we have to do and that's educate our students. So we'll continue to follow our mission. So the campus has really changed too, aside from COVID. Um, uh, we're still renovating our buildings. We're, you mentioned Stephen Hall before. Stevens Hall is being renovated right now to be ADA compliant. We're trying to really ramp up a lot of our classrooms so that they're technologically uh, wired, so to speak. But uh, some of them look great, but they don't really, they're not really for uh, the kind of technology and teaching we need to do for 2021, 20. And so we're working on that. We are, we've just got a wonderful donation of a quarter of a million dollars for uh, upgrading pedagogy and technology for student retention from the Allison France family. And that's going into the library and they're working on that right now. So I, that's gonna be really helpful for the faculty and the students because we'll really be ramping things up. Pedagogy, teaching online, despite the emergency pivot, one third of us were already online at this university, but uh, despite that pivot, 
teaching online shouldn't be an emergency endeavor. It should be a very thoughtful process. And so that's really what we want to do going forward to make sure that those students who do take things online do it and, and have a great learning experience. And we're working very uh, strategically on that. Moore Hall, AKA Music Hall, Conservatory Hall, if you go way, way back, next to Becht and right between the sandwich to Egbert, is being renovated right now. They tore down the, uh, the porch that was on the slide that looked like, on the side that looked like it was falling down anyway, and they're putting in a, an elevator there, so it's ADA. Um, it's not only ADA and compliant. Um, Egbert, we're looking at remodeling. I'd like to turn that into a, a student learning center. And for the students. So everything's about, for me, is about teaching and about really focus on students. Uh, Gemmel was renovated a few years ago beautifully, and there's more work that they want to do on that even more. Um, we put in, we started our President's Commission on Sustainability last year, and the, we got a complaint from the city because we didn't mow the lawn. Well, that's not the lawn <laughs> to be mowed. It's, it's, law, it's wheatgrass that is a sustainable grass right next to the science center. So I said, we need to put some signage up to educate the community so we don't get compliance about not mowing because that's what it's about. It's, it's to absorb the rain runoff and, and actually help with water drainage and so forth. So we're doing all of those things. And Tippin, of course, you mentioned before, Taylor, Tippin, $50 million renovated. When people say to me, well, is Clarion going to go away? And I'm thinking, okay, they just took over our housing debt. They just gave us $50 million for Tippin. We're renovating all these things. We're investing in technology and online teaching. So, and I didn't come here to close a university. So I laugh when people jump to that. But, but of course, you know, these are scary times and, and there, is, there is a lot less funding. You mentioned before about how you're both uh, scholarship recipients. And one of the things that a primary role of a presidency today versus when Diane was a president, and even when Joe was a president, a huge piece of it is fundraising, and to, because we don't get as much money from the state. And so that's a lot of what I do is, uh, is raising funds. Last year, we raised almost $3 million. It's a lot of money for a small school. We raised a lot of money, emergency money, when you all had to leave campus, and every bit of that was distributed to students. We moved very quickly to refunding students housing and, and different fees and different things last spring. Uh, and uh, we were one of the first in passion to do that. And I, we put a lot of pressure on our, and they stepped up for it. They, we really wanted to get that money back in the hands of students as quickly as we could. Not everybody got as much as they wanted, but everything we could send back, we did. And so those are the, that's, you know, you asked me about the differences of the campus today. We've moved from primarily teacher education to teaching, business, and health. Health is a big piece of what we do. We used to be more of a liberal arts underpinning university as the core. We still have that as the core. Uh, we don't have as many liberal arts programs as that we used to have. And a lot of that is really dictated by the students themselves. They, they kind of vote with their tuition, what programs they sign up for. And if you have low enrolled programs and even after you, you may love to teach certain things, but if it's not really part of what is a helping person get a good life and get a job, that program may need to go into moratorium for a while. And those are really hard decisions because very often alumni get very angry. I remember the first football game I went to down, at, <laughs> went to the stadium down in, in, in Pittsburgh and an alumni came right up to me and started yelling at me because we closed the music education program. And I said, I'm very sorry about that. Tell me a little bit about your experience at Clarion. And we, we talked about it, but you know, it, it, again, you know, it'd be like, what, what if we didn't need nurses someday, Caitlin? And wouldn't that be great if everybody was so healthy that we, we didn't need to have, we didn't need to have nurses, but, but suddenly we got rid of the nursing program. And about uh, maybe eight years ago, we had a workforce reduction and we're, we always, you always have to have workforce reductions in terms of just for planning. Some of them are, and unfortunately the one eight years ago was pretty brutal. And the, um, they collapsed the College of Education and Health and Human Services into another college, uh, Arts and Sciences, and then created a new College of uh, Health and Human Services, Health Sciences and Human Services. Well, when they did all of that, people thought we closed down teacher preparation. We didn't. And so, but the media, it was bad. 
and uh, people were very angry about that. Now we, we had our Dean of Health leave. We combined education with health and human service again, and we have a wonderful Dean of Education who's also the Dean of Health, and we did it, and we just keep rolling along, but sometimes we get some bad media. I think also Clarion, because we're small, we don't, you know, all the great things that are going on, and there's so many wonderful things all the time happening. But that doesn't hit the news because we're not really that big. You know, we're not like Penn State big. But if something bad happens, that hits the news. And right, exactly. So uh, as the fundraiser and the chief storyteller for the institution, uh, the role of a presidency is very different today. And it's a, it's a 24 seven obligation. You have to do a lot of things and, um, but it's good work. So uh, it's worth it. Yeah, and I wanted to just bring up something that Dr. Dale didn't mention. I've heard this ever since you came to the university from all kinds of students that you are the student's president. That's a common <laughs> thing I've heard. And that's a very true thing. Like comparatively to other presidents we've had previously, students say they see you more, they hear you more. Um, they feel more of a connection with you. So um, I think that's a statement for how much the university is changing in, how much they care about their students and how not just in the presidency, but all of the faculty, the staff, they really do try to build connections with their students to make sure yeah. that they're getting what they need and that they're enjoying their time here. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we go back to talking about this being a teaching university, you know, those of us, those people who are in education will understand that teaching is about relationships. So if you, in your classroom, K-12, if you don't have a good relationship with your students and your student's family, that student's going to have problems learning with you and, uh, and trusting that you can steward their, their experience. And I think our teachers here, our faculty and, and, and many of our staff, particularly in student affairs, there's a synergy that they really do. They, when, when they say, how you doing? They wanna know. <laughs> it's just not a social construct. It's really true. So, uh, and that's one of the things, you could feel that vibe. I felt it when I got on campus during my interview. I could just tell. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really true. And I was at, I came from another university that was like that. It's a much larger university, about, about 29,000 students at that university. It's lower now because enrollment's down in Michigan, but, but it, uh, it, it was that kind of vibe. And when I got here, I said, oh, they've got it. They've got the student connection vibe. And, and you, just, you can just pick it up. You just know. So. And I miss seeing the students. I was so glad when, they, when we had 600 move back because it, the energy in town is just different, just with their being, their being back. And, um, and that, that, that's, that's good fuel. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think just on the point of everyone saying Clarion's closing or Clarion's merging, this is my fourth year at Clarion. Caitlin and I are both seniors. I have heard since I started Clarion that Clarion was closing. My first year in admissions, they were training me on phones and every other phone co call was someone saying, is Clarion closing down? It's like, I don't think. I hope not. I just paid my bill. Like, <laughs> that would be really unfortunate. Well, now you can say no. <laughs> <laughs> so when you hear that Clarion's closing down, just know for at least the last four years, we've heard that every year. Well, yeah. And, and I, I think that there's, uh, there's just kind of that, that sense. I mean, Pennsylvania just really hasn't had a whole lot of funds. And then, then Governor Wolf was really starting to pump some funding into education and COVID hit. And so, of course, you know, you, you've got to put that money back into businesses and health for sure. But, you know, he, he was really trying to ramp it up and uh, we kind of hit up. But we're not alone. You know, every state in the United States has got COVID issues. For sure. yeah. Well, with all of this in mind, I'd like to start our discussion questions. Okay. Discussion question number one for the group. Four of the 14 state universities of Pennsylvania are led by female presidents. That would include us, Cal U, East Strasburg, and Chippensburg. And research shows that there is a lower number of female presidents in higher education in comparison to male presidents, as Dr. Dale said. 
However, females show a higher participation in higher education, which is shown in Clarion. It's 60-30, or 60 Um. So the question is, why do you think there is such a discord between these numbers? And um, a statistic for our viewers to hear is, while the number of women to hold the positions of president has increased from 1986 um, as of two, 2011, women only held 27% of presidencies across all institutions of higher education. So why do we think that is the case? I'm going to say it's worse than you said because uh, Jerry Jones from Cal is retiring in January. Mm -hmm. Marsha Welsh just retired from East Strasburg. Wow. So now there are two women presidents as of January for PASHI, and I am going to brag, Lori Carter is the president of Shippensburg, and she is a Clarion alumna. Well, there you go. It's based on <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's a great president. She's wonderful. But uh, yeah, so it's going to be 12 men and uh, two women presidents in just a couple of months. That's crazy. That's so crazy. I, I, I did the stats, so you, you can tell me the why now. I have my, my ideas, but, but you know, you're, you are women who are leaders, and you're young in your professional careers, but this is just the beginning of, for you. And so, you know, what do you see as uh, why this might be? So an additional stat that I found, and I don't have the numbers with me right now, but when I was looking at how female presidents across universities look, is that while presidents tend to be male, um, positions like provosts, vice president of student affairs, those high level positions tend to be female. So you're elevating women to high levels in higher education, but you're not elevating them to presidency and my personal thought on it is simply that people traditionally think they want to see a man lead a company, a man lead a university, lead whatever it is you're working on, um, but they still know that women are achieving great things and so they're appointing them to these positions but they're not getting promoted at the same um, rate as their male counterparts. So you'll have a female student affairs vice president and a male provost and the provost could be elevated to president while the vice president of student affairs will remain the vice president of student affairs for another presidency waiting to be elevated. Um, unfortunately, higher education tends to be an up and out sort of thing. So if you're not continuing to elevate in higher education, you will tend to look at other institutions. Um, so you do sort of see people leaving who are really great at their positions, but they're not feeling um, respected or like they're maximizing their potential. And I really do think it just falls back on this idea that men are better leaders and it looks better to have a man as the face of your institution, which isn't always the case. I'm not saying they're bad leaders. They just aren't always the best for that position. It's kind of, in the United States, it's, it's kind of what we know that, but I, I think the next 10 years, we're just, it's, it's going to flip. It's, there are, women also have very different leadership styles. Uh, years ago, uh, the, the concept known as uh, the queen bee uh, was part of the uh, leadership uh, vocabulary many years ago. But the idea was the, a woman would come in and she would emulate male characteristics of leadership. And, uh, and they would try to be successful, even, even to the kind of suits and things. That's really shifted. And the kind of leadership that's needed in higher ed right now because of such limited resources is the very thing that many women are socialized to do and are very good at, multitask and collaborate. And th those are strengths that uh, I think you'll see bearing some fruit in the next, uh, in the next 10 years. Um, there are also, like you were saying, a lot of presidents in waiting. They've been associate vice presidents, in my case, a dean, um, and they've been in senior leadership roles. And at, we're going to have a mass amount of retirements in the next five years. They, they, and when that happens, uh, you will see many people, uh, people of color, 
and, uh, and uh, women moving into, into these roles. You'll see very, and I think that that's my big hope for higher ed too. The fact that, you know, like when we talk about the integration of different PASHI schools and working together, you know, we've been working with Cal University for months now on sharing some online collaborations. We are able, as we have these conversations, to talk about how our universities can maintain their unique identities, their on the ground bricks and mortar kinds of programs, and what we can share that's back and back office kind of things that the students never see. Like your billing, if your billing came from someplace else, but you still got the advising and the classes and things that you needed in the quality education, that really shouldn't matter to you. Uh, what matters to you is that you, you get the degree and the program that you need so you can be very competent for what you're doing. So we've been having these great conversations, and I think part of it is because Jerry Jones and, and Mike, our, our leadership styles are very similar. So when we sit down with our cabinets and talk about these things, it's a very easy conversation. I mean, they're hard stuff we're, we're grappling with, but still at the same time, it's easier than if we had two different, very different leadership styles. So I think you're going to see some changes in that. I think there's another thing too, Taylor, that we forget in society, uh, even though a lot of this has changed, women still are the primary caregivers uh, for the uh, families. And for, for women who have a career, who have children and who have parents, they are sandwiched in to doing two generations now, sometimes three. And, uh, you know, we, we, we're very mobile. So there are communities that when you're in a community, a long-standing community, you have a lot of supports built into your community that you that you can tap in, and that's a sort that's a big strength. But being very mobile, uh, you move around. Suddenly, you're in North Dakota, and your support system is back in Florida. Well, you can't call on your aunties or your friends or your neighbors to help you with the kids. So that means you have to do certain things. And if you're a single parent, it, it's even more challenging. And so I think that's a piece of, of what happens too. I just, um, there's a lot of responsibility that, uh, that we have in the world of home and the world of work. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's a piece that you take time off to, you know, physically women have to take time off. Very few of us can have a baby, get up the next day and go to work, you know? <laughs> and, and so, that's a piece of, but now we have shared maternity leave, we have paternity leave, we have family leave, we've got all kinds of things that are becoming more and more normalized in society. And, but 10, 15 years ago, when, when a man said he was taking a family leave, the eyebrows would go up like, oh, well, what's wrong with you? Well, nothing. I'm a good dad. Nothing's wrong with me. You know, but society judges. And so we, we hold the expectations. So um, but we're, this is your generation, and you will set the rules for change. And what's really great about the activism of the 60s and the 70s is it's come back. And, uh, and, but the, the thing is, you don't have to hold a sign and march. You just need to post something on social media. And you have a whole bunch of kindred spirits who can connect with you. And you, you really can do a lot of good do a lot of harm too, but you, but for, for social good, uh, this is a time when activism and changing systemic policies that really have hurt women's progress, people of color's progress, and so forth is uh, is is about to it's about to be turned on its ear, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see it happen. I know that when I was your age, I worked as a counselor in. Um, a center that was really helping women with a career development and going back to college and, and getting employment. At that time, and this is a long time ago, it was 69 cents to the dollar of income. It has only started to climb in the last 10 years up to 81% on the dollar. Because even six years ago, it was still 74, 75 cents on the dollar that a woman would make compared to a man in the same position. And, you know, for a long time, it was like through the 80s and 90s, I thought, when is this gonna change? This is really bad. But it is, it's starting to shift. You just kind of see it going up. Uh, and, and I also think that um, women are really learning how to professionally advocate for themselves. 
to ask for a just salary, to ask for things that are rightfully theirs. And I'll tell you, uh, even in 2007, this is only 13 years ago, when I interviewed for a faculty position, they really wanted me and they had a lot of things that they wanted me to do. And my, one of my doctoral students gave me this list of how to negotiate because she was going out and she was looking for new professorships. And I was like, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to be a full professor and I need to do this and this. And I had this, this list. So I very nicely put together a list of questions. The person who interviewed me told the chair of the search committee, I was pushy. And, and I, I was so taken aback by that because I, I thought I was very polite and I was just asking some really good questions. And I had never had anybody say that right to, right to me, giving that, fit, that feedback that I was pushy. And, I, you know, I'm a lot of things, but I'm usually pretty polite. <laughs> and, and, but I thought, well, if that's pushy, then God, Godish, I, you know, I'm going to be pushy because uh, I have a right to ask for these things. And it was a really good lesson in um, interviewing. I don't think on the whole, people like being called pushy or uh, in your face or whatever, but uh, I also think that part of professionally understanding what you are able to do, your skills, what you have to offer, not apologizing, being very realistic, and someone doesn't wanna pay for your worth then uh, there probably are other places you can go. And do you want to work in a place like that? Well, sometimes women don't have choices. You have to work where you work because you need to feed yourself, your kids, you know, your family, you have to eat and so forth. But uh, um, that, that's changing. And, and we need to keep pushing for that change. Because it's very important to be, not to be hired for a sub-worth. Yes. And something that I agree with you both and something that I'm thinking of from a women and gender studies perspective is you that go along with this. So one being, um, as Dr. Dale was saying, being responsive and willing to stand up for yourself when it comes to your workforce. So amplification. We've talked about the uh, theory of amplification multiple times on our podcast. Not only speaking out for yourself, but if there is another woman at the table with you working in your collaborative group, if you see them not being treated correctly, you also stand and push for them. If you're a man and you're seeing another woman and you're seeing a woman that is not getting the same treatment that you get, you need to continually amplify your voices so that way you're being heard and what is to correctly to happen is being recognized. Well, you know, we talk about standing square, you know, with, when you're advocating for uh, gay rights, when you're advocating for uh, the underserved, you know, and it's the same principle, using your voice uh, for good and not being disrespectful and talking over someone or for someone, but, you know, really bringing issues to the fore. Yes. And the second thing that I kept thinking about was the woman's second shift. So <laughs> right. we we're talking about the fact that there are few female presidents in higher education. And there was a statistic I saw on this. Women that want to strive for those type of positions are pretty much implying that they're going to have to put their home life if they have a family they're going to have to put that almost on the burner on the back burner and that's really hard because especially for a woman that makes you appear to be not a good mother not a good spouse not a good homemaker and it would be hard, like, for example, in Dr. Dale's position, where she says, like, it seems like she has two jobs. She's working here at the university to get things done here, but she's also working with the chancellor to get things done for PASHI. Well, and then, there's the thir then there's the third shift. <laughs> your family and everything else. And does that even leave time for you to have hobbies, enjoyments, you know, if you have anything else strenuous going on in your life? For men, it's seen as they can push some of those responsibilities off and that's okay. And, but for a woman, it's seen as you're being irresponsible if you choose to strive for those hard positions. So that's we another- a lot of, We hold a lot of judgment. Uh, uh, we, and we hold ourselves out to be too perfect, I think. And I, I remember reading articles, so uh, you, you can have it all. Well, actually you can't. You have to make decisions about what your priorities are. It's only so much time in the day. And um, I remember um, one of my colleagues, she, 
she put off having a baby till she was 36. And then when she wanted to have another baby, she couldn't because she was no longer as fertile. And then because of the tenure clock, she spent the first seven years of her baby's life running this, doing this research, uh, trying to get tenure. And by the time he was 10 years old, she said, I kind of missed his childhood. And she said, I don't think I would do that again. So that's why policies are put into place for, you know, like putting the uh, tenure clock uh, on pause so that if you take time out, that doesn't count against your time. Uh, but even though you might have good policies, as you were saying, the judgments that the social judgments and the social contracts we have, they, you may have a policy, but do people support it and buy into it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it also affects the way you go into the workforce because just because that's great for whenever you already have the position, but if you come into the position pregnant, freshly married, um, at childbearing age, they see that as an implication to maybe that would harm their business if they're going to have to take time out for to have uh, part time help while you're taking your time off. They see you almost as a hindrance, yeah. and that's a shame that we don't. Um, have those types of thoughts. If we're going to have those types of thoughts, they should be for men or women, but we don't think that way, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think we have pockets of great models in different states around the country and pockets of different organizations, but uh, as a whole, we have, we've got a lot of work to do to support our working women. Absolutely. So yeah. with that in mind, and given the previous statistics, question two, are you surprised that Clarion didn't have a female president until 1990? No. No, especially for the region, for Pennsylvania. Like we aren't as progressive as some other states. If we were looking at New York, which I did not research New York prior to this interview, um, I would be more surprised just because New York has such a more diverse um, population. But given what's happening here in Pennsylvania, I'm not as surprised. Well, I think you'd be surprised about New York. Uh, New York has clusters of urban areas, you know, and, and uh, especially down in the Jersey uh, tri area uh, and Pennsylvania, Jersey and New York. But a lot of New York is very much like Western Pennsylvania, especially upstate, it's huge. And uh, so, so I think across the SUNY system and across the CUNY system, you have a tremendous amount of variability in terms of leadership roles. And uh, yeah, so, and, and I think most people forget that most of America is rural, mm -hmm. you know? And so uh, Western Pennsylvania is pretty representative of, of uh, a lot that goes on in this country. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I, I think there's a lot of really swell and wonderful things about Western Pennsylvania. And I love the fact that people are so friendly and they love the environment here. And, you know, it, it, nature is so beautiful. We have a lot of good support, but we also have, uh, we have some ideas that are, are holdouts from a, a different day when people had different kinds of families and had different kinds of structures and, and different kinds of responsibilities. But uh, yeah, but I wasn't, I'm not surprised. I'm actually a little surprised we had one that soon. Like, I, I really am. Just with the area, with the history of Clarion, and, you know, it, it wasn't like the last male president had been a horrible president who they were kind of like, well, the last guy was bad, let's try it with a girl. Because <laughs> I feel like sometimes that is a reasoning people will have the girl can't be any worse than the last guy we had. So I am kind of surprised that we had one in the 90s. Now that is, um, going back to our first episode, right kind of at the peak wave of intersectional feminism when we were starting to say, you know, we're not, feminism isn't just white women, it's everyone, it's women, it's minorities, it's so, but I am surprised that it reached Clarion as quickly as it did. And I think that people were pretty surprised with the kind of president they had in her. She still held out to me as a wonderful example of a very wonderful president. Yeah. Yeah. And for our final question, how can universities better support their students of all genders when educational departments are often assumed to be gender specific? So for example, 
we commonly hear that STEM programs are a place for men, nursing is a place for women, um, engineering is a place for men, education is a place for women. So how can we be better at supporting everyone? That's a great question. Uh, of course, that's a pretty big myth about, uh, they also say that um, most physicians are men, when for the last 15 years, the introduction, the classes starting medical school are female dominated. Uh, so, and of course, the male uh, professions, professionals in nursing have really soared in terms uh, in the last 25 years. Right. I mean, we, in the STEM fields, uh, particularly uh, engineering is heavily, uh, heavily male dominated. I, what I like about Clarion is if you look at our, our, our scientists, they're largely female. And, you know, I'll, you know, Susie Boyden, Jackie Canals, you know, uh, you know uh, Jessica Thomas. I mean, we've got all of these women scientists. So we have a large, so I think part of it is having uh, faculty who are representative of the kind of students you want to invite. So one area we haven't done a good job in is inviting a lot of faculty of color, of, of color to the campus. We only have about 15 uh, coaches and faculty of color at Clarion University, and, and that's an area that uh, we're going to be working on uh, over the next few years. We have two uh, Frederick Douglass scholars who grad who are, are here at Clarion and have stayed here, Urena Pack and uh, Candace Matthews, but that's, that's not nearly enough. And so I think one of the ways to change that is to create faculty who invite faculty in because I know that if I see someone who looks like me and thinks like me, I'll be attracted to following that person and being a part of them. And, and that works for everybody. That's a piece of it. And I will say being in two departments. So I study under both the political science and the economics. The political science was completely male and the economics for the majority of the time I was under, it was majority female. And they were very different to study under them. I loved all my political science professors. They're great in their fields. They're great professors. But it is sort of different when you have, when you can see yourself in front of the classroom. So obviously, you don't see yourself in a male professor when you are a woman, but you do see yourself in a female professor. So I do think um, when you have departments that are entirely taught by one gender. So if nursing is completely taught by female nursing professors, it gives the appearance that it is a female-centered profession. And I will say the majority of my political science classes were female, and I would say my econ were probably 50-50 split. But if you look at like the English department until we had a lot of retirements, the psychology department was very mixed, very, a very good blend of, uh, of female and male. Um, and I, I think that part of it is the hiring practices. Uh, you can say you're going to have a search committee that really looks for um, diversity and representation of um, genders. Uh, but in the end, anyone can justify who they're hiring and really think they're doing a really good job of interviewing, but being blind to what they're not looking at. Mm -hmm. That really requires some very thoughtful training uh, on the part of uh, human resources and social equity, but it also requires administration holding search committees accountable. And one of the best statements that came out of one of the last passion meetings was with the president of uh, Westchester, who said, why are we hiring the same people all the time? You know, we, we've got these different positions. We need to be diversifying our, um, our, our faculty, our staff, and uh, with, with gender and with, with, uh, with race and ethnicity. And the answer is, you do what you do, what you know, and you're comfortable with. And, and, and thinking differently and really working deliberately to do things differently is painful. And it's, but, and it's not easy. And, uh, but that's what we have to do. 
Yeah, and I think another part of this that I want to bring up is the fact that once we have students in, uh, say, for example, with men being in nursing. So when we're having classes, if we have professors that recognize that um, men are usually called on more than women mm -hmm. in classes, um, they're usually asked more often about like pop quiz questions and different things like that. We need to try to recognize our implicit bias that we have. Yes. Yes. Um, whenever we're in nursing lab, I've had many professors that are like, let's get the boys to move all the things. Let's get the boys to do the mobility training. Um, if they're discussing things with us, they might make um, inferences, assuming that we all understand because it's something that women typically just know off the bat, but then they don't take the time to explain it to the men in the room. Same thing if it's a science field and it's mostly men with some women, make sure you're including them. Make sure that you're taking the time to recognize them and to uh, check on them and make sure that they're experiencing what they came here to experience. So I think that's a really good way. Yeah, that's a good way. Yeah, because then we make sure that not only are they enjoying what they're learning and they're learning at the same rate as their peers, but we're making sure that they're enjoying their field because if they're not feeling like they're, they're being represented or encouraged early on in their undergrad, then how are they going to go forth in their field and feel just as equal as to the men or the women in their field? Well, also caring, you know, if you look at the field of, of nursing, profession of nursing, if you don't share those, um, those secrets or those things that women know just because of their lived experience with your male counterparts, they're going to be caring for females. So you're really educating so that they can take the perspective of all their, their patients and their clients. And, and that's the same with teaching. It's the same with all the work that we do. Uh, those assumptions. Uh, but we do have biases. And when I moved to central Michigan, Bob was out getting the mail and the neighbor pulled up and said, oh, you must be the new dean to Bob. So Bob came in the house and he just, he just smiled and he said, no, I told him I wasn't the dean. <laughs> that my wife was the dean. And the person said, oh, 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 okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, sure. Yeah, mm, that could happen. You know, and so, uh, but that, because my name is Dale, um, that happens to me a lot. Uh, I get, I get people say, oh, I didn't know we invited a, uh, I said, a what? <laughs> and they'll say, oh, well, you're not, a, I, we thought you were a man. I said, well. Here I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Here I am. So, uh, a uh, funny thing, and I'll and I'll date myself, but then I'll I'll, I'll close my my comments. Um, I actually got a draft notice when uh, women were draft when women were not you know women weren't drafted, and uh, I got a draft notice because my name was Dale. Yeah. What did you do in that? Like, what would you do? Did you just have to contact him and be like? Oh yeah, you, you have to. Well, yeah, but but also, you know, it got me thinking about a lot of things. Like, well, why aren't women drafted? Why are men just drafted? I mean, all those questions that come out when you're, you know, a young person and start thinking about those things. But yeah, names and gender roles and stereotypes, all of those things, and uh, we we're as a society we're examining a lot of those things. But I I will say that women. In higher ed, as presidents, have a very strong track record in terms of being very good leaders. Um, I don't know that they're better than men, but I do know they deserve a place at the table, and they deserve a place at the table at fifty percent, not twenty-nine. Well, that was all we had for today's episode. I want to again thank Dr. Dale for taking the time out of her very busy schedule to come on here and talk with us about women in higher education and about Clarion and celebrating Founders Day. Taylor, I was just looking for our schedule. Do you happen to know what we're talking about next week? No, one second. <laughs> Well, I'll just say thank you so much for inviting me. It was my pleasure. I have a lot of respect for you both as leaders. You've taught me a lot in my two years at Clarion, and uh, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for being on the show. Next week with...
Constitution Day coming up. September is a very big month for us. Constitution Day is September 17th. Our episode will come out September 16th. We will be talking about the women who made America what it is today. As we often talk about our founding fathers, but we rarely talk about our founding mothers. Absolutely. All right, so we will see y'all next time and thank you for watching. Links up. This has been Wednesday's Women, sponsored by the Clarion University CU Engaged Coalition. The thoughts and ideas presented in this podcast are meant to be for entertainment purposes first and foremost, and we do not claim to be experts in any field. As always, thanks for listening and make sure you go out and register to vote.